ผมชื่อคมสิทธิ์วิสิทธิ์รัศมีวงศ์นะครับเดี๋ยวจะขอต่อด้วยเซสชันที่2เลยนะครับผมก็ขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่หัวข้อที่2ครับของงานสัมมนานะครับในหัวข้อการใช้ประโยชน์จากทรัพยากรชีวภาพของประเทศอย่างยั่งยืนและการทํางานอของเครือข่ายพันธมิตรนะครับครับก็การมันจะเป็นหัวข้ออาเกี่ยวกับาการใช้ประโยชน์จากทรัพยากรธรรมชาติอย่างยั่งยืนโดยสร้างมูลค่าทางเศรษฐกิจและตอบโจทย์การอนุรักษ์ในเวทีโลกครับโดยเราจะมีตัวอย่างครับในเซสชันนี้ที่ตอนนี้อยู่ในในขั้นตอนของความร่วมมือครับของการพัฒนางานวิจัยครับก็คือเกี่ยวข้องกับเทคโนโลยีเพื่อที่จะทําให้คาร์บอนนะครับสู่สภาวะความเป็นกลางหรือว่าภาษาอังกฤษที่เรียกว่าคาร์บอนนิวทรอลิตี้ครับผมสําหรับอาในหัวข้อนี้ครับเราจะมีอาวิทยากร3ท่านครับก็คืออาท่านแรกครับจะเป็นอาดรแม็กซิมครับเลชูเมชานครับจากทางฝรั่งเศสครับอันนี้จะเป็นออนไลน์ครับขณะที่อีก2ท่านนะครับวิทยากร2ท่านก็อยู่ในห้องประชุมนี้แล้วครับทีนี้ครับจากที่หัวข้อที่แล้วครับที่เราได้เกริ่นเกี่ยวกับการอนุรักษ์ทรัพยากรชีวภาพของประเทศครับจากเครือข่ายครับที่เป็นสเต็กโฮเดอร์ของประเทศของเรานะครับไม่ว่าจะเป็นการอนุรักษ์ทางด้านพืชและก็สัตว์นะครับผมก็นอกเหนือจากการจากการอนุรักษ์พวกนี้แล้วครับสิ่งหนึ่งที่ตามมาที่สําคัญนะครับก็จะเป็นในเรื่องของข้อมูลครับไม่ว่าจะเป็นข้อมูลความหลากหลายทางชีวภาพรวมไปถึงข้อมูลทางด้านอาระบบนิเวศวิทยาครับซึ่งไอข้อมูลเหล่านี้มันก็มีความสําคัญและมันสามารถนําไปต่อยอดใช้ประโยชน์ในอนาคตได้ครับซึ่งเดี๋ยวในลําดับต่อไปก็คือวิทยากร3ท่านนี้ครับก็จะมาพูดให้ฟังครับเกี่ยวกับเทคโนโลยีที่ณนะปัจจุบันเรากำลังโฟกัสกันอยู่ครับ so uh, apart from uh, sustainable conservation programs of uh, natural resources and uh, collaborative networking uh, conducted by stakeholders uh, data collection of biodiversity and ecosystem of natural resources is also crucial all of this data would make us understanding life cycle and ecosystem services of natural resources and contribution to Data utilization. During this session, we will have uh, three speakers who would uh, project the utilization of uh, biodiversity and uh, ecological data towards analysis of uh, above ground uh, above ground biomass and carbon credit. So uh, we will start uh, the session by uh, Dr. Maxim Lechumichan. He's the researcher. From uh, Institute of Research and Development, or IRD, he specializes in study on the dynamics of the composition and structure of tropical forests using field and remote sensing data. For today's topic, he will talk about monitoring forest carbon dynamics in tropical forests using field and remote sensing data. So, uh, Dr. Maxim. Yeah, you can start uh, the talk, please. Okay, so let me share with my screen. So, could you see the screen? Yes, uh, I see your screen. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. So, I uh, particularly thank the NBT for for inviting me to to give this talk. So, uh, this talk is entitled "Monitoring Forest Carbon Dynamics in Tropical Forests Using Field and Remote Sensing Observations." So, this is a quite large topic, but I will try to summarize some of the aspects to uh, uh, so that you uh, may uh, have some question, and I may go more into details if you want. So, as you know, vegetation acts as a sink of carbon through uh, photosynthesis. The uh, plants assimilate uh, CO2 and they store carbon in their tissues. So, if, for instance, you cut a tree, 
and you just dry it, the carbon will correspond to approximately half of the dry biomass. So let's see how is the global carbon cycle. So as you know, uh, we are emitting a lot of carbon through different sources from fossil fuel emissions that correspond to 7.7 .7 petagram of carbon per year and through uh, land use changes, uh, which is approximately 1.4 uh, petagram of carbon. So if we just concentrate on the effect of the deforestation and degradation in the tropics, we can see that this represents 8 to 15% of the total anthropogenic carbon emissions. So what this carbon, where this carbon goes? So a large part of this carbon go into the atmosphere and contribute to greenhouse uh, uh, effects. But <clears throat> some of this carbon is also stored in what we call natural seeds. So in the sea, 26% and 29% is captured in the vegetation. So vegetation is the most important natural sink uh, at the global scale. And if we look at the contribution of tropical forest in these natural sinks, it represents approximately 50% of the carbon stored in the vegetation currently. So this is equivalent to a quarter of a century of carbon emission from fossil fuel in trees. So there is a critical need for monitoring carbon dynamics in tropical forests. And I will explain to you uh, first where we are currently. So you can see on the left, so uh, sorry for that, it's uh, for Africa, but it's a place where uh, there is tricking divergence between estimates. So here you have four maps uh, that are actually uh, currently uh, considered as reference map. You have the map of Habitabile in 2016, of Bacini, which is a widely used, still widely used map, of Sachi 2011, also a very famous map, and of Santoro 2018. And what you can see is that both in terms of absolute values and in terms of spatial patterns, those maps seem to describe something totally different. So. If we use one map or the, on the other or the other one, we will get totally different estimate at the country level or something else. So the question is, why do we have such large discrepancies between these different maps that are presented as a reference map currently? The main explanation is that because biomass is rarely measured directly and it is it estimation at large scale involve many statistical steps that have all their own associated errors, from field measurements, where we do have some errors, from the conversion into uh, biomass and carbon, where we also have errors, in using remote sensing signals that have errors, the models that are using this, so that at the end we may have very large errors at the map scale. So. One of my uh, work is to understand how these errors, uh, what is the relative importance of these errors, and how we can minimize them. So first, how do we start uh, normally? So the most common approach from the field estimate is the one recommended currently by uh, IPCC, which is using destructive measurements from the field, weighting the, cutting the trees, weighting them, and building them from these trees, some equations that relate the biomass, AGB, above ground biomass, and some uh, of the measure from the trees. So the rho here is the wood density, the D is the diameter, and the H is the height of the total height of the tree. So using this equation, then we can make some non-destructive estimate of biomass by measuring the diameter, the height, and estimating the wood density of the tree. But in a work where we uh, use more than 4,000 trees to build this equation, we showed that at the individual tree, we may have up to 50% of error at the tree level. So naturally, a large share of this error are random, so that they average at the stand level, but still, this approach is generate a lot of errors. So how can we improve that? So currently, there are several works aiming at using non-destructive terrestrial LiDAR scanner systems 
So the LiDAR is a system that sends lasers, uh, laser pulse in the forest, and that can build, after that, 3D, that can build 3D models of, of trees, such as this one, from which we can uh, manually or automatically uh, dissociate the leaves from the wood, and then applying cylinder fitting algorithm, we can construct the volume of the tree very precisely. And this approach is known to provide very good estimate of the individual scale, so much better than the allometric equation that I just showed before, so with an error of, uh, with a precision of 88%. So you have the destructive volume, so the one that have been effectively measured uh, by uh, cutting the trees, and the one estimated by a QSM done before the tree was uh, cut down. But this kind of TLS measurements approach are can be hardly be yet fully automatized, and there are a lot of works currently to make it easier to uh, apply in the forest. So after that, when we have uh, biomass at the individual scale, how do we move from this individual biomass to, uh, stand, to the stand level? And how can we know how the error, individual errors, uh, average uh, propagate to the stone level. So here, I built a package, a uh, biomass package, the biomass package, which is our package, where we can uh, use the forest inventory data sets and from which we can uh, use the different um, um, a tree measurement, the wood density, the tree height, and the diameter, and where we propagate all the sorts of errors, from measurement errors to the model errors, so that at the end we have a biomass with uncertainty uh, through a Monte Carlo chain, where uh, we can get the biomass at the stand level with its associated uncertainty. So now, how do we move from the stand level to larger scales? So here, this is where remote sensing is extremely useful. And I will show you two examples just after, one with an airborne sensor and one with a satellite-based sensor. So how do we proceed generally? So we identify a set of remote sensing metrics that you can see in the x-axis, and we use the biomass estimated from the field in the y-axis. And we relate those two measurements and build a, what we call an inversion model that can then be applied to a large scale, producing maps and accounting for the errors that uh, we have with this map. So let's see an example with an example from Thailand, from the Kauai National Park, where we did a LiDAR campaign in 2017. So as you, you have an illustration here uh, on the bottom of the slide, <coughs> of the cloud points that can be generated by this kind of sensor. So you see that you have 3D models of the structure of the forest, which is precise <clears throat> almost at the symmetric level, and we, that we can get over 60 square kilometer uh, in, in our case. <clears throat> in the map on the right, you can see some uh, field plots that are managed by uh, NBT and by uh, the University of Kazetsarts, the scattered one. And we use this uh, field plot to estimate the biomass here that we have in the y-axis that we relate to some LiDAR metrics. And you see this red line represent the inversion model. So at the one hectare scale, we got an error of 14%, and this model can be then applied at the landscape scale over 60 square kilometers to estimate the biomass stored at the landscape scale. So, for instance, in uh, Kauai, we have nearly 300 uh, tons of air, uh, carbon per uh, of biomass per hectare, which corresponds to 138 tons of carbon per hectare. So, let's look then if we use some Landsat series, so you know that Landsat is a satellite that was launched in the uh, 1970s and from which we can estimate whether the statue of forest versus non-forest. So using a series of almost on a yearly basis from uh, 1973 to uh, 2017, we were able to date the forest, the young forest, 
and all the gray points are, are forests that were located between uh, zero years to 40 years. And we can relate the biomass that we estimated at the landscape scale to this age and estimate at the speed at which the forest store carbon. The, uh, so typically, after 20 years, typically, a forest will store 132 ton of uh, carbon per hectare, uh, of biomass, excuse me. And after 40 years, nearly almost uh, 300 ton of biomass. And those estimates invalidate the revision of the IPCC reference carbon accumulation rate that's recently halved for secondary forests in Southeast Asia. But this revision only used a few plots that were of very moderate quality about this estimate in Southeast Asia. And we just show in this paper that uh, this uh, uh, half, uh, halving this uh, estimate for uh, Southeast Asia is really unfair. So now let's move to the satellite base uh, signal. So we use using this LiDAR LGB map that have only 14% of errors, we just look at how it can be linked to satellite-based metrics. So we use three source, source of satellite images. So the Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, which is from the European Space Agency, and uh, Worldview-3, which is a private uh, company from a private company from Airbus, and that is quite expensive. And as you can see, here we can hardly detect, so you have the most of the biomass here, so the more it is red, the more points you have. And you see that, in fact, you have almost no signal after 200 ton per, uh, per, uh, per hectare, ton of biomass per hectare, you have almost no signal. This is what we call the saturation of the signal. That means that for small biomass values, you have an increase of the signal, but from one point, the signal does not respond to the increase in biomass. And we believe that this is a major source of error in current uh, satellite-based products that can explain why we do have these huge discrepancies between the maps that I showed before. So, to conclude, more effort should be done to understand and minimize the errors associated to the different steps. So this can be done by assimilating uh, steps where different scales can be uh, bridged by different instruments, including field measurement, drone-based measurement, airborne measurement, and at the end, satellite-based measurement. If you want to know more about these strategies, about how we can bridge the different scales, we have summarized this in the paper in 2019, showing how we can uh, achieve this goal by combining different uh, uh, technologies to have a move uh, to move to different scale, at just from the local to the global scale. We also are uh, <coughs> wrote uh, a protocol uh, that had been recently uh, published in 2021 about uh, how should we uh, uh, calibrate and validate the product of the biomass uh, products. And so we uh, had a working group on that uh, involving several institutions, and we hope that this will improve uh, the, the um, uh, improve the, 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 the methods and uh, minimize the errors in the features. And just to finish, uh, I just said that uh, the satellite, -based, one of the main problems of the satellite based measurement is the saturation of the signal. And you should know that there are currently two missions that uh, may act as a game changer. So the first one is the Global Ecosystem Dynamic Investigation, JEDI, which is supported by NASA, uh, that has been launched in 2019 up to now, and that is currently producing a lot of interesting information about forest structure. This is a laser that just do transects. So the problem is that still we have a problem to extrapolate to make to make continuous map because we only have transects. And in 2024, we will get the biomass uh, mission, which is a radar-based satellite, a PBAN uh, satellite, that will be launched in 2024 and this one will produce continuous estimate. So we think that combining these two uh, mission will definitely improve uh, the, the the quality of the uh, above ground carbon maps in the tropical forest. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Maxime. So um, I'm, it's it's very really amazed to me because uh, actually uh, with uh, this aim uh, to reduce uh, the carbon biomass uh, in our world, I think in this this technology should be a very very promising one. So um, according to your talk, I I think uh, you you try to uh, generate uh, the remote sensing data and combine uh, analyze with uh, the cut truth got through data from uh, the survey of plant species, right? So, so uh, I, I, I just wonder about the, the accuracy rate of, uh, of the calculation that we can get from uh, this stage of technology now, how, how close we are. Yeah, okay, thank you for this question. So, um, Okay, the accuracy, uh, uh, of course, uh, depends on the technology and also on the forest type. So the more biomass you have in your forest, the more errors that you will get, for sure. But typically, one of the targets, the target for the, 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 the large biomass maps is 20%, that uh, we want to uh, achieve an accuracy of 20% at large scale. So at the uh, individual level, at the field level, using terrestrial LiDAR systems, we can get achieve an accuracy of almost 90%, which is very nice. Uh, so I was uh, an error of 10% only. But the problem is, the question is how these errors propagate from one step to another one. So bridging using TLS terrestrial LiDAR system data from the field and then using LiDAR system airborne LiDAR system, so we can get a very good accuracy, we, we can be well below the 20% at the landscape scale or at the regional scale. The main problem now is the satellite uh, information. We do not have for now a satellite information that allow us to uh, go below 20%. And with this respect, we think that the biomass mission that is coming in 2020, uh, so next year, will be really a game changer. We Some preliminary analysis using airborne system indicates that we can be around 15% of error. So hopefully we'll be well below the 20% uh, targeted. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience here? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Maxim. <laughs>